Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days with fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating the saved from the unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal warmth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. And other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life. Um, and then uh, for next Sunday, this is, I'm going to do something I learned from, from William Barber. I want everybody to say, next Sunday. Next Sunday. Say two services. Two services. 9.15. 9.15. And 11. And 11. That's right. Next Sunday, our two-service format begins with 9.15 and 11. We all know that. Thank you. Well, since we're talking about labor this morning, I have to say that as an unabashed, unrepentant, and shameless fan of the New England Patriots, <laughs> how, how would it be possible for me not to begin my sermon with, with a little gloating um, about, about federal judge Richard Berman's decision, incredibly brilliant decision, if I may so say myself, um, to, to vacate New England quarterback Tom Brady's suspension. Bear, bear with me here. So, so on Thursday, I'm, I'm going there. On, on Thursday, the day of the judge's ruling, I went to Raleigh to attend the NAACP's voting rights rally, an uplifting gathering with, with William Barber and Cornell Brooks, the president of the national NAACP. And after that, I was kind of, it was Thursday evening in Raleigh, and so I decided that I was going to go um, to a restaurant and watch a quarter of UNC's first football game of the year. So I'm, so I'm at this sports restaurant in Raleigh, surrounded by football fans, and you know, now people have conversations. So, so somebody leans over and asks me, so, so what do you think of this whole Brady thing? And so, and so I give this answer. In the perennial struggle, <laughs> this is actually what I said. I said, in the perennial struggle between the rights and dignity of labor and ownership's tendency to oppress and exploit those who labor, I'm glad that labor came out victorious. The Brady case underscores the need for strong unions and the need to honor collective bargaining agreements, some things we really ought to remember this Labor Day weekend. I don't think the person I was talking to shared my views or my rooting interests. And unless you think I'm, I'm going sort of way afield, I'm not being entirely facetious here. I have, I have actually no problem sticking up for the labor rights of somebody making tens of millions of dollars, because if I didn't stick up for those labor rights, I would be implicitly backing the avarice of those worth billions. Even wealthy athletes, it turns out, need the protection of unions. And so I want to talk today about labor on this Labor Day weekend. And I'm going to talk about labor in a sense that may be a little bit different than how we normally think about it. Labor often makes us think of farm workers, like those farm workers uh, with flock who will receive the collection for this morning makes us think of people in mining, construction, and manufacturing, those in the service industry, in cleaning and in cooking. But this morning, I'd like us to talk about 
those who some of us may not first think of when they think of labor. I'm going to talk about those who labor as educators. And I was drawn to plan a sermon on the subject of of education labor for several reasons. Um, For one thing, my own personal testimony. I am the son of two career educators, a mother who taught high school English and drama for um, over 35 years, and a father who taught physics first at the university level for a decade and then um, at the high school level for 20 years. I grew up in a household in which the activities of the teachers' union was a regular part of dinnertime conversation, and I was steeped in that awareness of both the importance of unions and people together advocating for the rights of those who labor, as well as the threats posed to those who labor when they lose their voice. Also, I was drawn to this subject because this is a town with education at its center. I don't need to say that. We're home to the flagship university of, uh, of the univer- home to the flagship University of North Carolina, and we're a town with one of the highest ranked school districts in the entire state. For many of us here in this congregation, the state of education in North Carolina touches us every single day, and so it's worth uh, talking and thinking a little bit about. How is it for the educators in our state? If you've been following the news, it's clear that there is a lot of news that is discouraging for those who work in education here in North Carolina. In K through 12 education, North Carolina is consistently ranked as one of the 10 worst states in the country in terms of average teacher pay. It's one of the 10 worst states in the country in terms of the amount that it spends per student and it is a country that ranks dead last nationally when it comes to teacher raises over the past decade. When adjusted for inflation, the average K-12 through teacher in North Carolina, I'm told, saw their pay drop 17.4% between 2003-2004 and 2013-2014. And while legislature, the legislature has recently approved modest pay increases after several years of pay freezes, those increases have come under fire for their slightness, for the inequitable way in which they've been applied, and for those increases not even coming close to making up for the loss of income that teachers have suffered over the past decade. And of course, those largely insignificant pay increases were offset by a host of legislative maneuvers to restrict teacher rights and reduce reduce teacher benefits, including threatening to eliminate state-paid health retirement benefits for teachers. News reports tell us of a strong, ten, a strong trend in teachers migrating out of, state, out of state to take teacher positions in places like Texas and Virginia, as well as an increase in the numbers of teachers leaving the profession. Uh, in the Charlotte-Mecklenburg School District alone, the largest in the state, nearly 1,000 teachers announced last June that they would not be returning this fall. North Carolina educator James Hogan wrote a blog post in early August that was republished widely, um, including in its entirety in the Washington Post, where he wrote of the education climate in North Carolina, he wrote, I am no fan of hyperbole, but I mean it when I say this. North Carolina is waging war against public education. Our state is dismantling its public education system, and it didn't have to be this way. The pathway that brought us here was paved with underfunded budgets, tactical strikes against public school teachers, fundamental changes in how charter schools operate and how tax dollars can go to private or religious schools, and the erosion of our hallowed University of North Carolina. Hogan goes on to describe a vicious cycle of those who wage war on public education that goes like this. First, attack public education and claim that it's failing. Do this even though if you don't have evidence that it is so. Then cut funding for public education. Call it a bad investment and siphon those funds elsewhere. Then when underfunded schools begin to act like underfunded schools, repeat the process and institute further cuts. At the level of higher education, Recent years have seen similar attacks on education. 
The legislature's budget slashing has led to hundreds of millions of dollars in cuts to higher education. And this past year, we saw the ouster of UNC System President Tom Ross under conditions which have been widely speculated to have been motivated by partisan politics. We saw the shuttering of the UNC Research Institute for the Study of Poverty, Work, and Opportunity, alongside the closure or harassment of a number of centers studying biodiversity, civic engagement, social change, civil rights, diversity, and gender equality. And we can only guess why those particular centers were, um, um, were, set, apart, were set aside for harassment or closure. So why? Why is the political climate in our state so dead set on waging war against public education? Why this drive to dismantle public education? And I believe the reasons behind it are a blend of the financial and the ideological. The financial first, it's the easiest explanation. Follow the money, and you'll see that education is just about the largest expense at the state level. The government spends about a third of its budget on public education. And so in pursuing tax cuts for wealthy individuals and businesses, in order to give money away to those who need it least. The state has increased the tax burden on those who can least afford to pay and chopped money away from systems that help those who need help and serve the common good. Additionally, the legislature has diverted funds away from public education to for-profit educational institutions. And so on one level, the actions of the legislature can be explained in purely economic terms as kind of a Robin Hood in reverse. Give to the already rich, take from the needy. But on another level, there is an ideological element at play. What explains the more punitive actions by policymakers? I believe that many of our policymakers hold a fundamental contempt for education. For some, it is fundamental contempt for secularism and the disestablishment of religion, for others, it is fundamental contempt for multiculturalism or feminism and forms of thought that challenge or criticize the status quo. Waging war on education is a form of combating education's role in empowering critique of those who hold political power. Let me explain this point with somewhat of an extreme example. A friend of mine sent me a link to a website of a conservative Christian homeschooling organization. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not uh, taking a shot at people who decide to homeschool. People do that for a variety of reasons. Um, but this particular website was a website for people who decide to homeschool because they reject secular and the secular and multicultural and multireligious foundation of America's public school system and because they don't want their children exposed to teachings that might contradict their Christian faith. Um, and in some ways, what the Christian homeschoolers are doing is laudable. At least it's better than trying to get creationism taught in the science classrooms or books banned in English classes. But my friend sent me this link to the Christian homeschooling website because the website claimed, and I quote, that public education in our country is a Unitarian conspiracy to Unitarianize the nation. I love that, yeah. Uh, which is uh, interesting. So, so which, is, which, is an interesting, which is an interesting comment. And, and I bet you didn't know we were this powerful. <laughs> when I drive to church through the UNC campus, I cackle with my evil laugh. <laughs> How powerful is my kingdom? <laughs> and you think I spend all my time attending committee meetings here. There's all the secret meetings I have to go to 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 set the agenda for the public education in the country. <laughs> so public schools are a conspiracy to unitarianize the children of our country. What's, what is that outlandish claim all about? Well, it turns, out, it turns out that public education in our country was actually deeply influenced by Unitarianism. Horace Mann, the father of public education in our country, was a Unitarian. And of Mann, it has been said, no one did more than he, 
to establish in the minds of the American people the conception that education should be universal, non-sectarian, free, and that its aims should be social efficiency, civic virtue, and character, rather than mere learning or the advancement of sectarian ends. I'd like to observe that public education, when it does what it is intended to do, actually does produce some results that we celebrate as Unitarian Universalists. The idea that truth is not completely known and there needs to be a free and responsible and unfettered search for what is true and meaningful. That questioning authority is not only acceptable but as necessary. That to live in a multicultural world, we need to celebrate and honor our differences. That truth comes independently of its messenger. I invite you to take out, take out your hymnals and turn to number, to number 652. We're going to do a, see, who's, see who's awake, who's fallen, fallen asleep during this sermon already. Um, there's this great, this is from the uh, a contemporary of Horace Mann. This is from William Ellery Channing. It's a reading called The Great End 652, The Great End in Religious Instruction. And, and what seems to me here is true is that, is that if you change just a couple of the words, if you take out, it could be the great end in instruction. I invite you, we're gonna, we'll do it, we'll do it responsively, and, and you'll, I'll see if you agree with me. So, and I'll, and I'll take out the word religion. So, the great end in instruction is not to stamp our minds upon the young, but to stir up their own minds. Not to give them a definite amount of knowledge, but to inspire a fervent love of truth. Not to bind them by ineradicable prejudices to our particular sect or peculiar notions. Not to burden the memory, but to quicken and strengthen the power of thought. In a word, the great end is to awaken the soul, to excite and cherish spiritual life, to excite and cherish a life of learning. It fits pretty well, doesn't it? That, that, that's not entirely a religious point of view. That's a point of view that we would, we would find in the, the life of great, great classes that we've taken. And so we have people making laws about education who have contempt for education. At a march this summer, I saw a man wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with a slogan, those who can teach, those who can't pass laws about teaching. The t-shirt is true. The truth is that we've elected people to make decisions about education who have no legitimate business making decisions about education. Witness a few lines inserted into a bill last spring that, if left unchallenged, would have resulted in the closure of laboratories at public universities that are doing life-saving medical research. The professors running those labs would have left, gone out of state, set up labs researching HIV, researching treatment for burns in another state rather than face the restrictions that law would have put on them. Witness a county commissioner from another county, thankfully not, not one of the counties from which our membership draws, but a county commissioner floating the idea in a meeting of raising, maths, of, of raising math scores by doing away with musical education and hiring more math teachers. Oblivious, uh, oblivious to mountains of research that concludes that musical education leads to better performance in math. 
I have no patience for people who get elected to make decisions but who are too arrogant or too dumb or too distrusting or too filled with contempt to actually listen to experts and people who know what they are talking about. You want experts writing policy. You want to listen to the advice and experience and findings of people who know what they're talking about. You don't want to disregard professional standards because you don't like them. It's a travesty. Any time an elected person makes a decision but doesn't have the knowledge to understand the decision they are making or hasn't bothered to listen to people who actually do understand. In North Carolina, that t-shirt's true. Those who can teach and those who can't write the laws about teaching. So what are some things that we can do? Outside of overthrowing the government, which, by the way, will be my topic for next week. <laughs> I'm serious. Come back. <laughs> there are some things that we can do. And one thing we can do is to listen, to take the time to listen to the voices of educators in our state, listen to their frustrations, listen to them as they talk about morale, listen to them as they talk about their struggles, as well as their deep commitment and amplify their stories. Amplify their stories while challenging, while challenging narratives about education that defame educators and slander the education system. For the rest of the day today, and tomorrow on Labor Day, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and every day, we can also demonstrate our respect for and our appreciation for the work that people do. To recap, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. You get what you're willing to pay for. Labor deserves our respect. Even Tom Brady needs a union. And it's never too late to learn. Amen.